Okay, good evening, everyone. I'm Jill Clunan. I'm the adult programming librarian from Longwood Public Library. Thank you so much for joining us. A couple housekeeping things. We're gonna ask everyone to keep their um, Zoom on mute. And if you have a question, you can go ahead and type it in the chat and I will relay it to Denny. And this, this is being recorded. And um, I'd like to introduce Denny Daniel from the Museum of Interesting Things to talk about communication and can you hear me now? So take it away, Denny, thank you. Hi everyone. So I'm Denny Daniel. I curate the Museum of Interesting Things. And for over 12 years, we've been traveling around the country, showing people their iPhones, their iPods didn't, didn't pop out of thin air. Comes from a long line of inventions. In fact, pretty much everything you're gonna see on my table and today, uh, you could probably do with your iPhone. Um, but if you were alive 100 years ago, you'd have to have all these things in your pocket to do what your iPhone does. I kind of call it the, uh, the missing link factor, all the links in the chain until you get to your iPhone. So I try to pick up all those pieces and show you the, uh, the history behind things. And today we're doing our history of communication and I'll pepper it with a few other fun, you know, little interesting things as well that are kind of uh, what I call the stars of the show. And I always like to say, you know, it's basically the history of invention, uh, the Museum of Interesting Things. Um, so it allows me to do almost every genre because in every genre there's invention, whether it's fashion or it's film or it's communication. Um, and what really does an inventor do when he invents something? They've made it into some sort of rocket science, some sort of voodoo. Uh, you have to have a Columbia University PhD or something. Now, all an inventor really does is solve a problem. And every day, you guys solve a problem. Uh, whether it's a shortcut to uh, you know, work or it's a quicker way to butter your toast. Either way, every day you solve a problem and that is what an inventor do, does. That's what invention is. Um, so every day you're an inventor. It's not at all rocket science. And you're gonna see most of the items I he have here, I like to call it uh, common sense made complicated. Uh, most of the items are, are common sense and I'll go through them with you and you'll be like, yeah, you're right. It, it really does make sense. The first item I always like to show is one of my favorites. It was invented by Thomas Edison. Let me bring it up on the table here. So this, this is an original Thomas Edison cylinder record player. These are the first record players. They were invented around 1877. And this one is from the 1800s, the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, and they were popular from the 1880s until about the 1920s. Um, and basically, normally I would call one of you up from the audience. So everyone pretend that you're winding it. There's the wine. <laughs> and you would wind it like that. And basically there's a spring in here uh, that, that's pretty strong. It's like a car park. And you're basically winding the spring tight. And what happens if you wind it too tight? It'll obviously break. So you never want to wind these things too tight. So if, you're, if your monkey with cymbals breaks on you and stops doing the cymbals, and I do have a monkey with cymbals, hang on. <laughs> if you've got one of these <laughs> and he breaks on you, like this one, you never want to wind it more and more because obviously the spring is broke and you don't want to destroy it. You want to, or it may not be broke, but it may be stuck and you want to find out what is, you know, stopping it from, from unwinding. Because when it unwinds, it moves all the gears. So I'm going to unwind this one for you. I'm going to let it go. So this would have been the iPod. <laughs> back 120 years ago. I'm gonna to try to bring it a little closer for you. Okay, Thank <laughs> you. 
Now, I can see Kaya and, and Mika, your, the, your mom is getting angry. Look how angry she's getting that it's much too loud. Clearly, mom wants me to lower the volume, doesn't she? <laughs> so, so, hey kids, can, Mika, can you figure out where the volume is over here? Do you, do, Kaya, do you think you can figure out where the volume is? In fact, you know what? Everyone in the room, everyone, can you all take off your sock? <laughs> yeah, take off your shoe and your sock, and then you've got to put a sock in it because there is no volume. It's a horn. How do you lower the volume of a horn? You've got to put a sock in it. And in fact, we had, uh, and Jill will appreciate this, we had professional librarians look it up, and that term, put a sock in it, comes from the Edison Cylinder record player. Yeah, that's where it actually comes from. We had to have librarians look that up. Uh, and the guy who works on my machine lives in Long Island, and he actually met Edison's workers when he was a little kid. And he said, uh, he always says to me, you know, you know, Denny, the, the term put a sock in it comes from the Edison cylinder player. And I was like, really? And he goes, yeah, yeah, that's where it comes from, from the morning glory. The only, how do you lower the volume of a horn? That was Edison's first problem. When he brought this home and showed it to his mom, what do you think his mom said? His, his mom said, Tommy, that's very nice, but it's too loud. Lower the volume. And probably in a Jewish Brooklyn accent too, no less. <laughs> and then Edison, you know, couldn't figure out, and you know, the, the best way is to put a sock in it or to maybe cover it. And if you ever see those old fashioned record players, the big wood ones from the old days, those still have a horn. But it was considered like, your grandpa's record player, if the horn showed after 20, 30, 40 years, people thought that was cheesy. So pe people liked it to be in a cabinet, but it still had a horn. It was the doors of the cabinet that were the volume back then. My first Victrola that I ever bought, I remember seeing the doors and I said, oh, cool. It's got a cabinet. Let's see what's inside. I opened the doors and all of a sudden it was loud. And I'm like, whoa, that's loud. And I closed the doors and it was low. And I called the guy who sold it to me and I said, were the doors the first volume? <laughs> and he goes, yeah, <laughs> there was no other volume. You close the door. Just like when you're home and your mom says, it's too loud in your room, close your door. <laughs> that was volume back then, the door. And these were, you know, speaking of, you know, communication, these Edison didn't think that, um, that, that people could afford these machines. He thought it would be very expensive. So he thought it would be used for businesses. And businesses would use it as a dictation machine. Um, but music took off right away. He was not expecting Lady Gaga. <laughs> and, it, you know, this machine became more of a music machine. And he made another machine called the Edaphone. And I actually have one of those rare discs, the Edaphone discs. And these were his dictation machines. And it had a longer disc. I'm going to show you a piece of it. This one is all broken up. <laughs> That's an actual, believe it or not, wax cylinder. So the first records were made out of wax and it was, believe it or not, beeswax. And a few other ingredients to make it a little more sturdy. And then the later records, like this one over here, the later records were made out of celluloid, which is just a fancy word for plastic. And you can see that the name of the record is on the side here. Because there was nowhere else to put the name. <laughs> and this record is probably from the early 1900s, maybe 1902 or something. And celluloid, like I said, is just a fancy word for plastic. And everyone always thinks it's some sort of voodoo getting sound on this. I mean, look how beautiful that sounds. Hold on, let me wind it again. I mean, how do you get sound on that? Well, getting sound on that is not as hard as you might think. Hold on, I see a note there on the chat. Let's open it again. I was enjoying seeing everyone's faces. <laughs> ah, good question. What speed do they run in? So uh, everyone knows record players were 33 and a third. Then they had 45s, those cool little 45 records, 45 RPM, which stands for rotations per minute. Um, then someone mentioned 78. That was very fast. These were about 166. <laughs> 
Yeah, the Edison cylinders went very fast. And if it goes very fast, how much sound do you think went on one of these discs? Not much. <laughs> so the first records, the wax ones, only had two minutes. Yep, two minutes per record. So it would only have one song. I know your iPod, your iPhone, how many songs do you have on that? Like thousands? Yeah, one. <laughs> and this later record, this record, the celluloid plastic ones, only had four minutes on them. So if your song was Hey Jude, you were done at the chorus. <laughs> you didn't get too far. And believe it or not, these machines could record, so you'd sing into the horn. So I'd sing, by the light of the silvery moon. And then it went like a sewing machine up and down. Just like when my mouth, my tongue talks to you. Hello, hello. I'm making sound waves that hit your eardrum. What happens when you hit a drum makes a noise. So instead of hitting a drum, you could hit Plato, uh, not Plato, he was a big Greek guy, you don't want to hit him. Or you could hit tin, or you could hit wax, beeswax. So remember, you heard Ada Jones with a whole orchestra. The whole orchestra would have to be in this room. And they would all sing into this horn. <laughs> so she would sing, by the light of the silvery moon, or I'd say something like, hello. And when you play it back, hello. It's just moving air the same way my mouth, my tongue moves air. I make lots of noises with my mouth. Ask my mother, she'll tell you. So all the noises you guys make when you're talking are just sound waves. So if those sound waves, they could hit the wax here or they could hit my back wall. So if I put maybe peanut butter on my back wall, who knows, maybe I could play it back. So kids, if, if you see peanut butter on your bedroom wall, worry, your mom's listening to you. <laughs> so mom, you can't use peanut butter anymore. You have to use jelly <laughs> from now on on the walls. I'm sure you'd be happy to put, I'm sure everyone would be happy to put jelly on the walls. Yeah, that wouldn't be fun. I think, I don't know which one would be worse, the peanut butter or the jelly. My brother once put spaghetti all over the walls, but that's a different story. <laughs> so these machines originally, like I said, were considered dictaphone machines. And then later, you know, he realized that pretty much soon on, he realized that they were, you know, people wanted music. People were hungry for music. And Ada Jones, she was the first big uh, female recording artist, one of the first big re female recording artists. In fact, uh, she was kind of the Lady Gaga of the time. I am one of her biggest fans. I have about 30 of her records. I'm hoping she tours someday. Yeah, I don't know if she's going to be touring anytime soon. That record for, was from around 1902. Um, and most of her records, she was popular up until around 1920s. So I'm going to put this one away. And then break out my next cool device. What do you suppose that is? So it was called a Regina or a Calliope. And it's got kind of a cross between three things. It's kind of like a record player because it had these records, these metal records. And it's kind of like a player piano because you'll notice the records have holes in them. So it's kind of like a player piano. And it's also like a music box because it's a box that plays music. <laughs> And I'm gonna, I'm gonna play it for you. Uh, or here, all of you guys grab that and wind it like that. Pretend you're winding it. <laughs> and hang on, let me get my glasses here. Hi, Dan. Did you, you, did you try to wind that? <laughs> so you would wind it like that. And then I'll let it go. So if your sister didn't play guitar, if your brother didn't play piano, this was music for hundreds of years. This one is from around the 1880s and they go back around three to 400 years. Uh, this one was made in Germany. Um, and these were basically the first record players and it was basically making music. 
like a player piano. So each one of these holes would grab a hook. And then that hook would be maybe the G note or the B note or the D note. And I'll even show you the, uh, the hooks. So each one of those is a different note, just like with a player piano. Now, this device here, this device here inspired something very modern. And I'm not sure if you've heard of this extremely modern device. And uh, I'm so sorry, uh, Jill, to expose you to this modern device. And now all these people are going to want uh, the library to buy one of these extremely modern devices. And I'm so sorry to all of you that have kids because now your kids are gonna want one of these extremely modern devices that 400 year old technology inspired. I'm not sure anyone has heard of this modern device. Does anyone know what this is? Has anyone heard of a computer? Have you guys heard of this thing, the, the computer? Oh, you've heard of the computer, huh? Well, this 400 year old technology inspired the computer because this is a computer punch card. And you notice that the computer punch card has the same kind of holes as the calliope. We think of a computer as electronics, software, you know, all, the, all these programs. But think of the word, a computer, a computing device. They saw it as a mechanical device. Um, so the, initial, the original computers ran on these punch cards just like a player piano. And it, 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 computers were inspired by player pianos and looms and these calliopes. So I put this, this card inside. In fact, when I was a little boy, my sister, she went to Columbia University and Queens College, and she used to come home with stacks of these cards. So she'd put this card in the computer and it would go shoot, 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 and it would communicate with the computer. Um, so it would program the computer. So the, you'd have a stack of these and it might be uh, Microsoft Word, or you'd have a stack of these and it would be like, what was that program, uh, that game, Fortnite? <laughs> that everybody loves. <laughs> so it kind of be like one of those computer games. Um, this was the first way to program a computer. It was basically a mechanical uh, device, just like the old mechanical pianos, the player pianos, and all that stuff. And in fact, I mentioned the loom. Someone did me a huge favor. I'm part of the steampunk community in New York, and this is an actual punch card from a loom. So these, this one is more modern, but these go back 400 years. And you would have this big wooden wheel. And you put this on the loom, and the wheel would spin. And these holes were, were done just right. So it would program the loom. And what does a loom do? It does you know, clothing. It does fabric. So uh, it might program the loom to do the label on your jacket or it might program it to do some other part of your clothing. Uh, but this was the first programmable machine, one of the first programmable machines, the looms. And these are the actual cards that it used. And if you go on YouTube, you'll see one of these giant looms using one of these uh, cards to program it. And you'd have a different card for everything that you needed uh, to program. So anyone know what this is here? What do you think? Do you want to type it in? Let's see what my chat box says. Let's see if someone got it right on the first try. Ah, someone said the Morris code. And I always love when people say Morris code first because the Morris code was actually the language that it would use. This was the telegraph keyer. Um, so it's a telegraph, right? Exactly. Someone just put in telegraph or, uh, so, but the Morse code was the language that it used and it could use other languages. Uh, just like when I'm talking to you, Morse code was just a language. So I'm talking to you in English. 
then I can לדבר איתכם עוד פעם בעברית, and אבלה אספניול פוקו, פוקיטו. Or I can revert back to English. Uh, my father uh, recently passed, but when he used to be here for my shows, I, I loved it because he spoke nine languages. And so when my dad was in the room, and now he's up there laughing, going, oh, yeah, that's me. He would, I would say to him, Abba, can you, I called him Abba, could you say that in Russian? And he would say it in Russian. And I'd say, can you say that in Turkish? And he would say it in Turkish. And I'd say, can you say it in Greek? And he'd say it in Greek. And then I'd say, can you say it in Najdidan? What, you guys don't know the, the language Najdidan? Najdidan is over 5,000 years old. It's a dialect of Aramaic, um, the language that Moses and Jesus would have spoke. It's the language, the original language of the Bible. And my mother, who's still alive, I'll be going home to her tonight, she, uh, she still speaks those languages, those 5,780-year-old languages, fluently. Whenever they want to talk uh, secrets about me, they always use Najdidan, because I think there's four and a half people on the entire planet that still know this language. It's like nobody speaks this language anymore, but my parents. Um, but Morse code is just a language. Now, I had to do a show once in New Jersey on the history of communication, and I forgot the, I forgot the telegraph here. And I was like, how do I do a show about the telegraph without the telegraph? And my worker goes, oh, you, you're like a cowboy. You always have a way. And I'm like, no, I have no clue. <laughs> and, and we were like on the New Jersey Turnpike. And I'm thinking, where do I get a telegraph keyer on the New Jersey Turnpike after the year 2000? <laughs> I was like, there's no way I'm going to find a telegraph keyer. And, you know, we get to the venue and I set up the table. And my worker goes, you always have a way, right? You, you've got an idea, right? And I said, no, I really have no clue. And then all, we had a whole bunch of people there. It was a school. It was a whole bunch of kids. A hundred kids came in the room. And he's looking at me from the back of the room. And he goes, you know what you're doing, right? And I said, no, <laughs> I have no clue. He goes, how are you going to demonstrate the telegraph without the telegraph? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> and finally, I got to this point in the lecture. And I realized... Like I said, it's common sense made complicated. So it must be easy to explain. And I thought about it, and you know what I did? I ran all the way to the back of the room. Let me see if I have, hold on, let me see if I have one of these here. Hold on, I'll be right there. I went all the way to the back of the room, and I did this, and I did that, and I did this. What am I doing? I'm turning the light on and off, yeah. And that's really all a telegraph keyer does. It's just electricity. And you're turning the electricity on and off. So I turned the lights on in the room and I turned the lights off in the room and on in the room. And I said, that's all a telegraph keyer is doing. It's just electricity. And then some guy is holding, has got earphones on him and he's hearing bzz, 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 bzz. And he's going, oh, then he's trying to communicate with me using the, the language, the Morse code. And, um, when I was a kid, I used to see those, you know, the Morse code was this bunch of dots and a bunch of dashes. And to me, it looked like some sort of crazy voodoo. I was like, what, what, how do you, how does anyone read this? It's a bunch of dots and dashes. I could never figure them out. And now it just came to me. I was like, oh, of course. The dots are when you go quickly. And the dashes are when you hold the button. That's the dash. And I thought, oh my God. So uh, how many people are in the room? There's like 10 to, to 15 people in the room. Look how I spent 12 years of schooling in New York City. I spent four years at NYU. I even did a summer session at Oxford University and got straight A's and could not figure out the telegraph. All those years. Watch how quickly all of you, adults and kids, figure this out. Okay, kids. Is this a dot or a dash? Bzz. Put up the, fi well, the finger one for a dot and two fingers for dash. Look how, look how quickly all of you learn that. Is this a dot or a dash? Bzz. Look how quickly. I spent 12 years of schooling, four years at NYU, and a summer session at Oxford. I should at least get my money back for NYU. You guys learned that in what, three seconds? So you learned the dot and the dash. So if I told you, 
that you know the letter A, right? You know the sound a letter A makes, right? Ah, uh, okay. Well, you all learned the letter A. If I told you the letter A in Morse code is a dot and a dash, tell me if I'm doing it right. Was that the letter A? Everyone nod? Excellent. You just learned the letter A. So if you can speak English, then you learned the Morse code, the letter A, in like what, five seconds? Within a week, you could probably learn the whole Morse code. You could be speaking Morse code for all you know. Then your mom's uh, would never. Then your mom would never understand what you were saying. <laughs> you could go beep 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 beep. We. I had uh, one of my helpers, uh, Enoch, when he was about seven or eight years old. We went to Washington D.C. to do this big science and engineering festival, and Lockheed Martin. Uh, we were invited by them. We were their uh, guests. And one guy from Lockheed was in the back of the room. Our table was packed. And my Enoch, at like seven or eight years old, was trying to do SOS. And he was pressing it going, look, Denny, I learned SOS. And a guy in the back of the room goes, son, you're doing that wrong. And I'm like, wow, you know it that well? He goes, yeah. <laughs> I said, you were in the Army, weren't you? He goes, yep, I was in the Army. And you were the telegraph guy, weren't you? And he goes, yep. I was the telegraph guy. So he knew it so well. Like you learned the letter A, he knew the whole alphabet and how to speak Morse code, and he could hear it and decipher it right away. If you ever watch the movie The Matrix, it's like looking at the numbers and knowing immediately what they say. The guy was so good. I was so impressed. Now, telegraphs go back a long time. And I learned something a bunch of years ago that I just couldn't believe was real. You guys aren't going to believe this. Guys, I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to ask you an interesting question. Can you do me a favor, everyone in the room? Can everyone in the room do me a favor and go on to Home Depot's website? I'm kidding. Don't really do that. Go on to Home Depot. Can you go to Home Depot for me? And can you pick up some string? I need some string. In fact, I need a lot of string. In fact, you know how much string I need? I need enough string to go from here to England. Yeah, I want you to run that string. Can you all of you do that? Not, not just the kids, the adults too. The, the adults and the kids. Can you guys run me some string all the way to England? Like maybe tie all your shoelaces together. Yeah, I need to run a line to England. Yeah, no, that's, that doesn't sound like fun. Well, you're not going to believe when they did this. In the year 1858, before the Civil War, two New York, I'm so proud of this, New York entrepreneurs decided we need to communicate with England. And the only way to communicate with England was pretty hard back then. We need to do a telegraph to England. So they had to run a cable, an actual cable, all the way to England. And the way they did it was they had two boats. One boat sailed from America. One boat sailed from England. They met in the middle of the ocean. And, they, and while it was sailing, it was releasing a giant cable. Now, we're working with a library today. Look it up on the library's website, the transatlantic cable. You will see these boats with a giant cable inside the boat that they were releasing in the middle of the ocean. Kind of like when you were a kid and you ran speaker wire behind the sofa. But this was the world's largest sofa. It was the Atlantic Ocean <laughs> that you ran your speaker wire. And, uh, and I actually have a piece of that cable. There it is. That is a piece of the transatlantic cable from 1858. And I don't know if you can read what it says, but I'll read it to you. It, this section was sold in a shop in a store you know, Tiffany's. Does everyone know Tiffany's? This was sold for 50 cents at Tiffany's shop. This was extra, extra sections of the cable. How cool is that? This is an original Tiffany section and it says on it, Tiffany's Transatlantic Cable, Tiffany's, 1858. And it came with a, with a note that was written by Cyrus Field, one of the people that was in charge of this whole endeavor, Cyrus Field. So I actually have the note and I have the original cable. And in fact, around my neck is a cross section of the cable as well. So every time you see me, this is a piece of the transatlantic cable. And you'll notice, now first there is just the, you know, the part of the jewelry. But You'll see the metal here, this is steel. That was to protect the cable. Then the black here is rubber. And then that was also to protect the cable. You see the dot in the middle? 
the dot in the middle is the actual cable that ran the electricity. So that went all the way to England, believe it or not. That's a piece of the transatlantic cable. There's a couple of uh, messages here. Let's see what everyone is saying to me. Morse code, telegraph, where are your parents from, what languages, and uh, how many conductors was the cable? Um, my parents are from Russia. That's where my parents were from. And I'm not sure about the second question. We'll have to look that up. Um, but yeah, my parents are actually from Russia, but they lived all over the world. They spoke nine languages and they lived everywhere. My parents met when they were, my mom met my dad when she was seven years old. <laughs> so they've known each other forever, <laughs> for a very long time at the middle. Now, uh, quick question, Denny. Uh, yes, how, many my, uh, how many miles was the cable, do you know? Oh God, from here to London. I don't, well, it didn't actually go to London. It, it went from the northern part of America to the northern part of the UK because obviously London wouldn't be such a great thing, but I've forgotten the amount of miles. I'm not, I'm not one of those people that like, oh, you know, statistics and miles. I love the stories and the fun to it. That's what the library is for and all the experts and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but it was quite a few thousands of miles and the cable was no joke. That first cable, by the way, when they finally connected America with England, um, that first cable lasted about two weeks and then it got a short and failed. But when in the beginning, there were, there were parades down the streets of New York and England and all over the world because you can now communicate. It was a huge thing. I mean, think about it. The only other way to communicate would be to send a letter on a boat. And communication was a big thing. You've all heard of uh, Andrew Jackson and you've heard of the Battle of New Orleans. Well, that battle was a mistake. We declared peace, but back before 1858 to declare peace, you know, in the war of 1812, when we're fighting with England, how do you declare peace? You, you've got to declare peace, but you've got to send that message back to America. So the message has to go for a guy on a horse, has to ride a horse to the water. And then when he gets to the water, he has to give the note to a guy on a boat. And then the guy on the boat sails on the boat for a month or two. So the guy on the horse is spending a week or two riding the horse. And then the guy on the boat is spending a month or two on the boat. And then the guy in the boat's getting to New York. He's getting to the East Coast. The Battle of New Orleans is down south in New Orleans. So now he's, he's got to give that note to another guy on a horse. You want to ride a horse from New York to all the way to Louisiana? That doesn't take a day. So when you declare peace, it could take a month to two months for soldiers to find out about it. And war is hell, you know, we're laughing about it, but war isn't a fun thing, especially with musket bullets. Believe me, you don't wanna be hit by a musket bullet before they had all the medications that we have today. So any kind of communication, whether or not you wanna tell your mom, I'm coming home for dinner, <laughs> or you wanna tell people in battle, we declared peace, you can all have fun now. <laughs> Either way, communication is important and, sent, and the telegraph was worth lots of money. So the first one failed, but after the Civil War, we were a little distracted during the Civil War. But after that, um, the, lots of entrepreneurs actually uh, did many, many cables. Oh, someone put up in the chat the miles. Thank you, librarian. Uh, it's always good to have a librarian on staff, uh, if that was the librarian, <laughs> Jill. Um, yes, so that was me. I thought so. <laughs> She's my, uh, uh, my Googler or researcher. Um, so... So I actually have some of the prospectus of businesses that, that applied to the United States government to run cables. It was in the thousands of dollars in the 1860s. Um, thousands of dollars today is good. These guys were making lots of money. So it was worth it to go get a cable from Home Depot. <laughs> uh, not that there was a Home Depot back then, but it was worth it. In fact, they got the world's largest boat for the second cable. Uh, it was kind of the spruce goose. And um, I, I don't know, Jill, if you can find a picture of that boat and the cable, it's beautiful. It's a really huge boat because they realized having two boats and putting it in the center, you know, that's too much work. Maybe one boat and one cable would be a much better idea. And it once again was New York entrepreneurs. Uh, in my communication show, I always like to show him to entertain the librarian and the kids and all the fun people. my rabbit that reads the book.
<laughs> Part of our wind up circuit show and our communication show. You need one of these in the library, don't you? <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> yeah, I thought you would like that one. Now, you guys are all using your, uh, your telephones, your computers. But if you were alive 100 years ago, you would have been using one of these uh, to get on Zoom. <laughs> yeah, do you think this has Zoom? <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure about that. Yeah, this is an old box wooden telephone from around 1910. And believe it or not, this is a New York telephone. It says New York right on the back of it. And, uh, and this is the way you would have communicated back then. Wait a second. What, how do you communicate with this? What do you do? Well, I had some old guy look at me and he goes, hey, son, you see, you ever see movies when they do this? And I said, yeah. He goes, you know what they're doing? I said, uh, I can guess, but you probably know. He goes, yeah. What they're doing is they're, they're, they're making a phone call because they, they're waking up an operator. Yeah, that's what they're doing. They would have to, you'd have to call back. I mean, how do you make a phone call? What's it missing? What's missing from this phone? The dials, right? The numbers. There's no numbers. How do you make a phone call? I, I, I love it when I do some shows and some people say to me, well, it's missing a screen. I'm like, yeah, you're right. It doesn't have a screen. And one kid said, it's missing apps. And I'm like, you're right. I mean, technically, it's not a wrong answer. It is missing the apps. And maybe earlier ones had apps. No, I don't think so. Not even later ones of these wood phones had apps. But it is missing a screen and app, but it's also missing the numbers. Um, so how would you make a phone call? You, you'd go like this, and I would do a clicking sound in the operator's ear, and you'd say, hello, hello, Gertrude, Gertrude. I, I need to talk to, to, to who, who's on my chat? Let's see, who's, who's on this? Uh, let's see, Marianne. <laughs> I need to talk to Marianne <laughs> in Hoboken. Uh, Marianne, I love putting people in Hoboken. <laughs> and then, so, so the operator in New York, Gertrude, <laughs> would call the operator in Hoboken. Who would that be? Uh, Agnes. I love those names. So, the, so Ag Gertrude would call Agnes and Agnes would go, what, what, what do you want? I, I want to talk to Mary Ann uh, from, from Gilligan's Island. <laughs> you got to love Mary Ann. <laughs> and there she's got, you see, she's got the phone to her ear already. <laughs> Although it looks like it might be a water bottle phone. Um, yeah, that's an underwater phone. That's the transatlantic cable underwater. <laughs> Clearly. So, so you would call the operator and wait a second, where is this phone? Is this phone in your pocket? Is this phone in the kitchen? The living room? Where, where is this phone? Do you know what guys? This phone isn't even in your house. Do you know where the railway station is? Do you know where the post office is? Uh, do you know where the general store is? What we'd know as a deli? Well, that's where this phone is. Wait a second. If Agnes is getting the phone call and she's you know, the operator is in the deli or she's in a, you know, she's somewhere else or she's in her house. How does she tell you guys in your house that you got a phone call? I did this demonstration in Westchester and some old guy said to me, you know what I used to do as a kid? I said, what'd you do as a kid? He said, as a kid, I used to hang around the candy store and every time the guy got a phone call, he would give me a dime to go on my bicycle and tell someone they got a phone call. I said, you're kidding. You made a dime for every phone call in Westchester? He goes, yeah. I said, hey, parents, during COVID, if you could make a dime for every phone call in New York, you'd be doing pretty good. <laughs> you'd probably quit your jobs. <laughs> yeah, making a dime for every phone call. That was good. Well, back then, there weren't that many phone calls. There weren't that many phones. There would be one phone in the whole town, and the whole town would share that phone. If you were lucky, if you were not lucky, the phone was in the next town. So guys, I hope you all know how to ride a horse because you would have to get on your horse and you'd have to ride to the next town to get, to get your phone call. It wasn't so easy back then. And remember I said inventors would invent things to solve problems. So the first problem was there's too many people in the town and Gertrude, the operator, couldn't remember all your names. So they decided to give people a number. And that's where you get the telephone numbers and the dials on the telephones because there were so many people in the town. And, of, and at first it was four numbers, then five numbers, then six numbers. Each time a different inventor, a different person tried to solve the problem of there being more than a hundred people, more than a thousand. 
And now we've got 8 million people just in New York City. So no operator could remember all of that. Although someone told me a joke. Who knows more than the CIA, the FBI, and the United States government? The operator. Because she would listen to everybody's phone calls because it was like a party line. So she knew what everybody's business was. <laughs> so yeah, she knew more than everybody. So I'm going to put this one away. And I'm going to show you something really cool. And I'm wondering if you, any of you would be able to even know at all what this is. Let me open that chat up. Uh, there are new cables, and some of those are in use. People were laying cable in the 1950s. Oh my God, who was that? Frank, you're incredible. You're right. It is a pneumatic tube. That was impressive. You guessed that pretty quickly, Frank. Yeah, this is one of those pneumatic tubes. Um, back in the day, if you went to motor vehicle and you wanted to get your driver's license and you, the motor vehicle had two floors or three floors and you were on the first floor filling out the paperwork, but it's the second floor where you get your drivers, where they give you the paper, where they give the paperwork and you get your license. Well, how do they get the, how do you, how do you get your paperwork to the second floor? What do the workers have to get in the elevator, walk up the staircase every time someone's waiting on line, there could be 50 people on the line. There's hundreds of people on the line. So you would put the paperwork inside here. So you'd put your paper in there, you'd close this, and there was a big plastic tube in the back of the wall and you would put this inside the tube and it would literally suck it up to the next floor with like air, it would go, like suction, it would go shoot. <laughs> and it would go up to the next floor in a split second. And that's how you got your paperwork up to the next floor. I remember my earliest memory when I was like you guys age, um, I remember going to motor vehicle with my mom and, and then putting this inside a plastic tube. And I, I remember that sound of it going shoot, shoot. I can still remember that sound because it was like magical to see these tubes going up a tube. And I was like, where does that go? The bathroom? <laughs> and they said, no, it goes to the office upstairs. I said, it looks like the sewer pipe. <laughs> they said, hopefully we won't confuse your paperwork with the sewer. I said, yeah, well, if you're a really bad driver, maybe that's where they put your tube. <laughs> they, they put it in the sewer pipe and it goes down into the, the, the city sewer system. Uh, that's only for the bad drivers. I was a good driver, so mine actually went upstairs. Uh, and my parents were okay. <laughs> my mom only now got her first ticket after all these years. So the next item, let me see how we're doing with time. I didn't even look at the clock at all. <laughs> Ah, okay, we still have about 15 minutes and that's good, we're getting towards the end. Now, um, for those of you uh, that have kids and I see the kids in the room, and for those of you who are married and you have a husband, you may want to borrow one of these. Mm. Anyone know what that is? No. Any ideas of what that is? Let me open my chat up again. Nope. That oh, the chat didn't open. I got a funny screen. Mm. No, Dan, you used a pneumatic tube today at the at your bank. Get out of here! I don't believe you. You'll have to send me a picture of that. <laughs> mm. Yes, Frank, JC, and the library figured out too. <laughs> yes, that is a hearing aid. This is a hearing aid from the 1800s. It was it was considered a walking tube or a speaking tube or a hearing aid. So I would put this in my ear like that. And I'd go, what? Speak up, son. I can't hear you. Talk a little louder. So you'd walk around the street holding one of these and you go, what? What'd mm. you say? So, so when, you're, when your spouse doesn't hear you, you may want to borrow one of these things. It might help you out there. <laughs> we'll send you. Oh. Mm. I almost caught that. We'll send a photo of the modern pneumatic tube. Oh, yeah, please, Dan. That would be really cool. Yeah. And by the way, definitely if you guys... I do a speakeasy and now I do it once uh, a week on Sundays. And the next one is a bouncing ball sing-along with 16 millimeter films. So if you want, uh, I guess uh, Jill put my 
my email up on the chat and then, you know, people send an email or go on the website and send an email to me and I'll invite you to our speakeasies. Once a, once a week, we're showing old 16 millimeter films. And the next one is, I probably have the world's largest collection of bouncing ball sing-along films. Uh, so we're gonna be playing those films and then you guys can sing along. And if you don't sing in tune, I'll never know. You could just turn your microphone off. <laughs> and I'll just assume by looking at your lips that you're in tune. You don't have, you, you, it's okay if you're live. <laughs> now, another one of my interesting devices. What do you suppose that is? Mm. So believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the world's smallest record player. Yep. This is the Mighty Tiny from 1968. Mm. And are you ready to see all the adults go ooh and ah and a librarian? Mm. <laughs> There's her ooh and ah. There it is, the world's smallest oh, record. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yep, that is the world's smallest record. It held 30 seconds of cheesy music from a 19, around 1968. And I actually have some records. There you go. Mm. How cool is that? Mm -hmm. And a four pack would cost 38 cents or 34 cents, something like that. This, these are marches. But I know you guys are much cooler than that. You don't want marches. That's boring. You want rock and roll. So I got you the rock and roll pack. Mm. You recognize those very, very famous rock stars? Mm. <laughs> I don't know how this is rock and roll. Nobody here looks like they're rock and roll. There's not one rock star in that bunch there. <laughs> I don't see the Beatles or anything on that bunch. <laughs> I guess they couldn't get the rights to the really famous oh. rock stars, so they put whoever they could. Um, but yeah, that was an early record player. And speaking of different ways of communicating and making sound and doing things, what, do, what does that look like? Mm. Mm. Well, it looks like a Volkswagen bus, but it's not. It's also a record player. It has a needle on the bottom. So you would put this on your record and it would drive around the record and play the record, play the grooves of the record while it was driving. It was called the sound wagon. Hmm. But I, and it was from the early 1970s, but a lot of people nicknamed it the record killer because after this drove around your record, your record was basically roadkill. Yeah, <laughs> so I don't think you'd want to put any record you really liked <laughs> uh, underneath that thing. That's an interesting device. What does it look like? So it looks like a saxophone, right? But it's not just a saxophone. It's actually a pleo sax. And you, there's the name over there, Pleo Sax. And the Pleo Sax also works on the same principle as the Calliope or the Regina. It's a player piano saxophone. It's a saxophone that plays itself. So you could program it. And how did you program it? You put it in a tube of paper here. And then when you were blowing into it, the paper had holes in it. And the holes in the paper would either cover the notes or play the notes. And that's how you programmed it. It was like a player piano. And I have one of those tubes that's very, very fragile. Mm. But it was made by the QRS company right here in New York. And this is the company that made millions and millions of player piano rolls. So they also made a Playo saxophone, Playo sax, that plays itself. And here is the actual song. This was a march. So this would go on your saxophone and play the notes for you as you were blowing into it. And it would get the notes just right. A pleo sax, or I like to call it a saxophone for dummies. <laughs> like those four dummy books. <laughs> so the next item I wanna show you, what do you suppose that is? Mm. 
You can even put on your microphones. I don't care. <laughs> I'm born and raised in New York. It looks like a pocket watch. Right. It looks like a pocket watch, you know, but it wasn't exactly a pocket watch. Yeah. It was actually a camera. You open this up like that, wow. and then you advance this like that. And when mm. I press this button, I just took a picture of you, all of you secretly, although oh. something tells me you all knew about it. Yeah, yeah, this was actually a spy device. It was a mm. spy camera. Mm. And I'll show you something cool. I'll show you the guts. Mm. Wow. It was the Expo camera. And mm -hmm. you'll notice it says from what, 1904? Mm -hmm. wow. From New York. Wow. It is a New York item. I have a whole New York mm. show and I love getting New York items because it's so mm -hmm. fun. So what I find, it, it's already cool enough. One of our, uh, mm. one of my earliest helpers uh, ran the Mississippi library system. And mm. she researched this and called me up personally and said, Denny, how much do you like what I do for you? And I said, why? What'd you find out about this thing? She goes, well, how much do you like what I do for you as a librarian? And I said, what did you find out about the spy camera? And she goes, well, they used to use it in New York in um, boxing matches where cameras weren't allowed. They didn't allow photography. So somebody would show up and it looked like they were holding a pocket watch when they were actually taking pictures of the boxing match secretly. Huh? Then under here was a cartridge of film. So what would they do with that film? They would take that cartridge and they would actually put it in a little capsule about this big and they'd put it on a pigeon. Yep, they'd put it on a carrier pigeon and the pigeon would fly it to the newspaper. Because imagine if you were in Queens and you had to get to Manhattan, what's the, you think, what is the quickest way to get to Manhattan? Well, back then there was a horse and buggy. That's going to take forever to go, get on the horse and ride the horse over the bridge. A bird flies right over the water <laughs> in, a moment's, in a moment's notice. So they actually used carrier pigeons to scoop the other reporters. Um, and we actually looked it up. It was really true. They used carrier pigeons. And I have some of those... Um, some of those capsules, they were about this big in plastic and you would open it up and put your note in it. And the army used this. Uh, the, the carrier pigeon goes back thousands of years and even the United States Army in World War I, World War II, and I even have some of the booklets uh, from Korean War. So it's verified that in the Korean War, we were still using uh, carrier pigeons. And I'm trying to find out if I can find anyone that knows, maybe uh, Jill can help me out with the library and see if we've used the carrier pigeons in the Vietnam War. That's the only war I'm not sure we used carrier pigeons. But right here in New York, uh, on Avenue A, uh, everyone keeps telling me, wanting me to, uh, wanting to introduce me to some guy that on the roof of his building still uses carrier pigeons. And in Brooklyn, I don't know if you guys remember driving down the BQE, coming towards the Williamsburg Bridge on the left side when you're driving towards Manhattan, there were all these pigeon uh, coops. There were these people that would have pigeons, carrier pigeons and racing pigeons. And you would see them in formation, flying around and coming around in circles. That was somebody's pigeons. <laughs> and I always like to ask people, so you've got a carrier pigeon with a note, right? So do you tell the carrier pigeon? Carrier pigeon, Bob, let's call him Bob. <laughs> I need to send that note to 34th Street and 6th Avenue. And then the carrier pigeon knows what you're saying and goes to 34th and 6th, oh. or he goes to 23rd and 7th Avenue. Where does, a where, where does a pigeon go? Well, if a it's park. called a homing pigeon, <laughs> where would a pigeon go? A yeah. park. <laughs> he goes, oh. well, yes, they do take detours. <laughs> that's, why, that's where triplicate comes from. Doing a note in triplicate was because one pigeon would get lost and go to the park. Another <laughs> pigeon would find a mate and go off to Hawaii. Oh, and another pigeon was <laughs> dinner for a crow. <laughs> so yeah, you wanted to have like a couple of pigeons with the same note. That's where the triple kind of comes from. Uh, but a pigeon goes home. So everyone in the room, if I put a note <laughs> on your foot, 
you're 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 gonna go home tonight, right? Well, you're all home now, <laughs> but you you're gonna go home. Mm -hmm. You're all carrier pigeons. Every when you go to school, kids, when you go to school and you get a note from the teacher, go like this, because that makes you a carrier pigeon. The teacher might as well put the note on your foot. <laughs> and think about it. Anything could be a carrier pigeon. You could have a carrier moose. You could have a carrier giraffe. Mm -hmm. Don't all animals go home? Mm -hmm. The only thing is a giraffe is a little conspicuous. So if you're in World War II and you're trying to send a secret note to your commander, if you send a giraffe, <laughs> I think the Germans will find him. I think they'll notice a giant giraffe walking through the minefield. So yeah, I don't think a giraffe would be a good idea. Probably a good idea would be a pigeon, so they picked pigeons. Although the Russians, I heard, tried a cat. Can you tell a cat what to do? Yeah, no. The cat was a really bad idea. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why they didn't think dog. I always think to myself, it was clearly men who thought of trying a cat. Any woman would tell you, hello. <laughs> <laughs> a cat's not going to go anywhere. <laughs> a cat's going to go off into the wilderness and your note's going nowhere. <laughs> you know? So yeah, they, I think they should have tried a dog. That would have been a much smarter move. And speaking of Germans and communication, anyone know what this is? You're never going to guess that, so I'm going to tell you pretty quick. <laughs> no. This is one of the most important Holy Grail items in the museum. You're not going to believe it. This is a part of the German Enigma machine. And if you don't know what the, oh my God, somebody, Frank, you're good. I'm impressed. Yeah, this is a, this is a rudder from the Enigma machine. And what is the Enigma machine? It was a cipher machine. And what does a cipher machine do? It encodes your messages. It makes your note a secret. So if I'm typing all, all, all of the soldiers are on 34th Street and 7th Avenue, you don't want the enemy to know that. <laughs> you don't want the enemy to know where your base is. So you would type the soldiers are, but let's say the letter S for soldier was when you type S, it won't type S, it'll type Z. Huh. And every letter will be replaced by other letters so that you wouldn't know anyone looking at it. It looks like a, a what's this gobbledygook? <laughs> I can't read this. But the guy on the other end, he has the same cipher machine and kind of like, you know, those luggage, you know, things, those luggage locks where you turn these. So he would have this programmed correctly. And I always liked that, that movie, the, the spoof on uh, Star Wars, uh, Spaceballs, uh, where, where I think Mel Brooks's uh, luggage uh, combination was one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> so when the guy goes, who would use one, two, three, four, five as their combination? Mel Brooks goes, change my luggage. <laughs> That's the bad combination. So yeah, you would have a combination and the, the guy on the other side would have a combination. So when I wrote the letter to him and said, mm -hmm. our base is on 34th street, he would see a note that said our base is on 34th street and the Germans would get it encoded and it wouldn't, they couldn't read it because it would say, it would have all the letters jumbled up and make no sense. So this was the most important thing in the war because this was the information to tell you where the Germans were, how many there were, how many guns they had. This was the secret behind what the Germans were saying and the allies couldn't figure it out. And it was a whole big to do to try to crack the code of the Enigma machine. So these are very rare, they're very hard to find. I actually have five of these rudders in the museum because I just think they're so cool to have uh, that they actually used this to win the war and eventually they conquered it and they, they cracked the code. Um, and there's a, there's a great uh, movie uh, that everyone tells me about, um, The Imitation Game, I think it was called. And if you guys want to uh, get that on, you know, whatever, Netflix or on YouTube, uh, it'll tell you all about how they cracked the code. And it's not too far off. I mean, you know, it's pretty close to the, to the reality of kind of what happened. Remember, I always like to show something fun here. We're doing history and communication. Here is my bear that answers the telephone. <laughs> How cute. How cute. cute. Isn't he great? Yes. You gotta love all the fun automatons that they have there. Now he's gonna do that all day long in the background. So if you hear ringing in the background, it's not ghosts, it's my bear.
going crazy on me more and more. What did they say? Carrier pigeons were used in the U.S. Army unit. Ah, <laughs> it didn't give me the rest of the thing. Yeah, in 1957, in my quick research. Yes, I do know that in the 50s, they used it. What I'm curious is, did they use them in Vietnam in the 60s? I want to know how far up the carrier pigeon goes. And my branch manager librarian uh, in Mississippi is inundated with stuff. <laughs> Does anyone know the IBM ball? Do you remember these? The 80s? This was a big thing in the 80s. Typewriters back then would have typewriter keys. So every time you pressed the, a letter, a key would go tuk and press. And you pressed A and went tuk and put an A on your paper. So every time you press the letter, but if you press too many letters, if you type too quickly, it would go like this. And all the, all the keys would get all bunched up and you'd have to unbunch them. Uh, this is like an early memory of mine, seeing the, the typewriter keys get all bunched up. My sister used to have a Smith Corona typewriter, uh, and it always used to get bunched up like that. And that's why we use your typewriter keys for your keyboard now. On all your computers, it's called QWERTY. Why is it called QWERTY? Because if you look, the keys in a row spell out the word QWERTY, Q-W-E-R-T-Y, I believe. Um, so that's that method of typewriter of putting the keys. Why don't we do A, B, C, D, E, F, G? Why? Because someone developed this QWERTY system and why did they develop it so that you can type faster? No, actually it's to slow you down. Yeah, it's actually to slow you down a little bit because if you typed too quickly, then, um, thank you for that. They didn't use them past 57. <laughs> So, because if you type too quickly, it would mess up your typewriter. So QWERTY actually is an inefficient way to design keyboards, computer keyboards. There were faster methods. If you go on my website, you'll see one of the German computers that had a faster method. It was a better way to put the keys. And there's a lot of typewriter societies that want to change your typewriter and your computer because they're like, why are we using this old 1800s slow way of typewriting we, we of typewriter key design because now we don't have typewriter keys. <laughs> now we have keyboards that don't bunch up. So you could use the faster way, but now everyone knows where the letters are. So nobody wants to change their computer. Everyone's like, I know where the A is now. I know where the B is, but they're all, like I said, they're not, they're done to slow you down. So had, this is the, this came out in the eighties and, and it revolutionized typewriting because now it's a ball, not a bunch of keys. So when, the ball, when you pressed A, the ball turned to the A and went boom and pressed an A. And when you typed B, it, it went to the B and it went boom and typed B. And every time it went to a letter, it went boom. But now it doesn't have keys. That'll never bunch up. It's the IBM ball. It changed typewriters. Everybody wanted the IBM Selectric. That was the typewriter to use for everything. Um, had they had one of these, these balls back in the 1800s, then they would have, that we would have changed typewriting. Well, they did. There was a, a German company that actually had a round key. You'll even see it on my website, Jill, if you can find it on my website quickly, put a picture up. Um, but yeah, they actually had uh, a ball back in the 1800s, believe it or not. So we re, I, I always like to say my joke here is, IBM reinvented the wheel a hundred years later, <laughs> because they already had this in the 1880s. How impressive is that? Now we're getting towards the end of the show and I've got lots of cool items to show you guys. Uh, you guys have iPads and all those machines. Well, how long do you think we've had the iPad? These were the first iPads before the iPad. It was called the, uh, the Apple Newton. I don't know if anyone in the room remembers the Newton I've done shows where teachers are like, oh yeah, I had one of these. And I had one teacher in New Jersey that turned mine on and started using it. And I'm like, oh my God, because you think of iPads as after the year 2000, this is 1992. They actually had that concept, the Apple Newton in 1992. So basically Apple reinvented the iPad. <laughs> it was called the Newton and they rebranded it, the iPad, and all of a sudden it blew up. But back then, it didn't really take off. 
It was only like geeks that owned it. And uh, just as a fun joke, <laughs> everyone remember AOL? Mm. Do you remember getting, what is it, uh, AOL 5.0? Mm. Look, I've got 500 hours of internet for free. Mm. So we consider it, oh, it's easy to communicate, to text message and talk to people today and, and do all that. You're on the computer right now for how long? An hour. But back then, when I was a kid, you paid $3 an hour. Now you think, well, that's crazy, but it's not a lot of money, $3 an hour. I remember the first time I got an AOL account at $3 an hour, the first month I had AOL when I was a little kid, I got a $300 bill <laughs> on the oh. credit card. Yeah, that's how much I was on the internet back then as a little boy. So imagine, you know, how expensive it must have been. The hour, $3 adds up. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about how much time you spend watching movies and chatting and surfing the web at three bucks an hour. So when, when AOL gave you 500 hours for free, you took it. <laughs> you were happy to get the 500 hours for free. Yeah, they were making millions of dollars back then. Meanwhile, now it's all free. So imagine that. Now, another one of my favorite items. Who, who owns a cell phone? A smartphone. Everyone owns a smartphone. How long do you think we've had the smartphone? What do you think? Five years, 10 years, 20 years? Well, it goes back a little further. This is the world's first smartphone. Mm. The Simon. It was two companies, IBM and Bell South, that came up with this smartphone. And it really was a smartphone. It actually had a touch screen. And you could get on the internet with this. You can check your email. And it had an address book and everything. So this really was the first smartphone. It was very expensive. It was around 1992 when it came out. And it was over a grand. And it was very uh, expensive to use besides the price of the phone. But yeah, this was the first smartphone. Mm. 1992. We think all our technology is so, you know, new and all that. But yeah, it goes back quite a bit. So how are we doing with time? I think we're almost at the, we're a little over, but we started late. So we can go a little over. Is that okay, Jim? Fine, that's fine. Yep, yep mm -hmm. good. So the, one of the stars of my show, I always like mm -hmm. to kind of end with this item, the solar space phone. How cool is that? Yep, from around 1962, the solar space phone. I see Jill is like, I got to see this myself. <laughs> yeah, this is one of my favorite items. Uh, my friend who worked at Coney Island had an auction shop and he had this on his floor. And I said, oh my God, I got to get it. And he was like, it was so much, I couldn't get it that time. And thank God I didn't because for the price of that one, I bought two. <laughs> and now I've got three or four of them because it's become a star of my show. Yep. 1962, they made the solar space phone. It really was a solar space phone. So the sun's rays came down like that. And then he would talk into this solar space phone and the sun's rays would turn his voice into energy, solar power. And then that would go across there and it would go over to her. And then she had this headset and it would convert the solar energy back into voice. And then she would listen to what he said, solar energy, solar power, the solar space phone. Now this is 1962, so I always find it kind of interesting. Ladies, the guy can only talk and she can only listen. Clearly this is 1962, you gotta love it. <laughs> and if you think the box looks cool, and by the way, anyone remember Newsweek? As seen on Newsweek, how cool is that? Mm -hmm. um, if you think the box is cool, wait till you see the actual solar space phone. Mm. How? cool is that? And I'm going to take them out for you. I know Frank wants one of these, right, Frank? <laughs> <laughs> so you would hold this. You guys would hold this. I would hold this. I'll be listening today. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you would talk into this and you'd go, mm -hmm. Denny, can you hear me now? And the sun's ray would, would hit this you know, kind of plasticky, mirror-y thing. 
and the sun's ray, and it would reflect it into there. Mm. And then I would hear you guys all saying, Denny, can you hear mm. me now? All of you scream into that. <laughs> <laughs> Denny, um, come in. Hello. 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 Everyone Hello. scream into that. <laughs> and then I can hear you guys. Wait, I got to aim it at. Okay, I can hear you guys. Wait a second, guys, we're indoors and it's nighttime. There's no solar energy at night. <laughs> no wonder. <laughs> and, and do you know what I love about this? Think about it. You guys aren't thinking. This has to hit the sun and then it has to go in there, which means that this has to see this. So the person holding this oh, gosh, yeah. can see the person holding that. So why do mm. they need the solar space phone? Couldn't they just talk? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're right next to each other. <laughs> you know, if it's got to shine into it. I always thought that was absurd that people bought these things. Mm -hmm. And basically, they had to be within eye shot of the person. So you mm -hmm. could just say, Jill, how you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Why did I need the solar space phone for that? Jill can hear me. Hear me. She sees me. Yeah, it wasn't that hard to do. Yeah, I always found this thing kind of cute and funny uh, every time I demonstrate it. So, so uh, pretty much that is our show, except, except for one thing guys, except for one small thing. Um, while I was doing this show, uh, I got a couple of phone calls. And, and, and I know it's terribly rude as a performer, as a lecturer to, to, you know, make a phone call in the middle of a presentation. And, and you know, that, that's terribly rude. But, you know, one of those phone calls, they could have been my mom. And, you know, you should always call your mom, right? So do you guys mind if I just call my mom? Is that, is that okay? Uh, I, I know this. Can you guys just mingle for a second? Hold on. Stay right there. I'm just going to call my mom. Hold on a second. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Mm. Hi, Ma. I can't talk to you right now. I'm doing a presentation. Oh, did you think I would use my little cell phone? No. <laughs> this is the first portable telephone. Yep, mm. this giant attache case telephone. <laughs> yep, from the 1970s. Mm. Yeah, this is what you guys would have carried around. And everyone, hold out your hands. Imagine carrying this around wherever you go. Wait, are you, do you guys have your cell phones? Let me see your cell phones. I, I got you on Gallup. Let me see your cell Oh, Jill, no, no, Dan, that, that, those aren't portable telephones. Look, your telephones don't have one of these. They don't have a handle. You need a handle like this one on your cell phones. Yeah, that's what you need. You need a handle. Then it's a, you guys need to get a grip. <laughs> you need a handle on your phone. Yeah, so these go back to, um, like I said, the 1970s. And actually, the first cell phone call was made right off the streets of New York. It was April 3rd, 1973. And it was a guy called Martin Cooper. He was a nice Jewish boy from New York. And who do you think he called? His mother. Why does everyone always guess his mom whenever <laughs> I say that? <laughs> he, you're close. He, well, he called his competition. He was working oh. for uh, Motorola, and he called AT&T, and it was a race to make the first cell phone call. So basically, he called them up, and he said, gotcha. <laughs> and the phone he used was similar to this one here that I have. So basically... There's pictures, if you go on the internet, Jill, I'm sure you can find this in the library uh, and post it. There's a picture of Martin using a phone that looked like this one right off the streets of New York, April 3rd, 1973. And he basically, yeah, like I said, he called AT&T and said, gotcha. Because like I said, it was, a, it, was a, it was a big race to make the first phone call. And it was that long ago, 1973, that they already started having uh, these cell phones. And I'm actually in touch with Martin Cooper. He, he knows I do this show. He gets a kick out of it. Although he doesn't live in New York anymore. He moved to California. I keep trying to get him to move back to New York. I'm like, dude, you're a New Yorker. You should be still in New York so you can, so you can come to the library and he can come to our show and actually do something. Uh, but yeah, these were the, the first phone calls. Um, and he's a really cool inventor. Look him up. He's actually done many, many very, very interesting and cool inventions. Uh, but that, and my mom used to always call in the middle of my show. That's how I wrote her into my show now. I, I, she actually did used to call every time I was demonstrating the box wooden telephone. My, mm -hmm. my phone was on vibrate and it would always go off and I'd look and it'd be like my mom. So I decided, you know what? I'm writing her into the show. <laughs> and that is my show. Thank you very much. <laughs>